What is going on? Who on earth are you? The man started yelling hysterically after he opened the door of his bedroom closet. As he gazed upon the mysterious man sleeping inside, he finally realized that his wife had been keeping a man in the closet for an entire month. This is the story of Jeffrey who met his end after a love triangle gone wrong. Jeffrey Freeman was born on September 11, 1960 to Hazel and Blaine Freeman. Friends and family described Jeffrey as a kind-hearted man who avoided aggression or conflict, and he held a prominent role at C.H. Robinson, a firm specializing in transportation and logistics. This was the time when Jeffrey met Martha, the woman he would later call his wife. Martha Ann Cockrell was born on December 16, 1964 in Bowling Green, Kentucky, the youngest of three siblings to Margaret and Clement Cockrell. After relocating to Nashville in 1994, she started working in sales for a local newspaper company, The Tennessean. As fate would have it, C.H. Robinson was responsible for logistics and transportation at the newspaper company Martha worked at. They soon got to know each other, and over time, their shared love of travel led them to bond and eventually become deeply committed to one another. In just a few months, the two eloped to Brentwood, Tennessee to begin their lives together. Following their marriage, Martha decided to make several other changes in her life to move forward in a new direction. She resigned from the Tennessean and earned a private investigator license to start her own private investigation company, Resifax. Its primary goal was to provide businesses and landlords with background checks and rental histories. In the beginning, Martha ran the business from her spare bedroom. The company, however, was performing so well that they had to move to a commercial office and hire two more employees, Tony and Tara, to handle more clients. It wasn't long before the caring husband quit his job at C.H. Robinson to help his wife in Resifax. Even though everything went well, no one could have predicted the dark twist that was looming. It all started going downhill when Martha began having serious mood swings. A lack of interest in her daily routine led her to confide in her employees that she wasn't feeling like her usual self. Eventually, Jeffrey convinced Martha to seek medical attention. The year was 2004, and she had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which was managed with medication. Unfortunately, Martha's mental health deteriorated as a result of her mother's passing. Unable to cope with everything that was happening, she left the entire business to Jeffrey. Even though Jeffrey had a lot on his plate, he did not neglect his wife despite the extra workload he was under. As much as he could, he assisted Martha in every way he could, even planning weekend getaways together for her sake. However, Martha often refused these retreats, preferring to remain alone in her room. On July 4, 2004, Jeffrey finally convinced Martha to go downtown to see the fireworks show that evening. In anticipation of spending the night at a hotel, they planned to explore the town. Things were going well, but as a result of his long work shifts, Jeffrey became exhausted after the fireworks and requested that Martha accompany him home. Clearly disappointed, she refused, and that resulted in a heated argument between the two of them. Ultimately, Jeffrey went back home alone while Martha stayed in a hotel. After that fateful night, the couple started having frequent fights and Martha eventually moved to a hotel called Candlewood Suites. In order to figure things out, she claimed she needed some space and time. As Jeffrey was concerned about his wife's mental health, he was open to it and agreed to her request. Even though their 10-year marriage was on the rocks, he continued to support Martha in every way he could during her long-term stay in the hotel. But strangely, it was at this point that Martha's desire to find herself changed its course of action. One afternoon, Martha's employee, Tony, went to her hotel room for an errand and discovered that she wasn't alone. In the course of her recuperation, she was staying with a man she called Christian. This man was an illegal immigrant from Mexico who spoke no English and whose real name is Rafael de Jesus Rocha Perez. By January 2005, Jeffrey was tired of being separated from Martha and went to her hotel room to get her back. She agreed to return home and ended her relationship with Rafael. However, what Jeffrey was not aware of was that Martha had instructed Tony to withdraw $100 from her ATM and give it to Rafael before sending him off to another city. Back home, though the couple now slept in different bedrooms, things started to improve between them. Regine, Martha's neighbor, also noticed an improvement in her mental health. Martha told her that she had recently discovered religion and could see the light at the end of the tunnel. And this was the last time she was seen by Regine. 
That was until one sunny afternoon at 4 p.m. on April 11, 2005, when Martha went out of her house and knocked on Ray Jean's door profusely. When she opened the door, Martha anxiously proclaimed, a man killed my husband. Ray Jean was shocked when she heard this and immediately called 911 for help. 911, what is it? However, the panicky Martha suddenly became stoic, barely even showing any signs of sadness. And throughout the emergency call, all she did was stand there emotionlessly. Ray Jean had assisted her in relaying the events as she thought Martha was too traumatized to speak to the operator. As the police and firefighters arrived at the Freeman household, a tense silence filled the air. With cautious steps, they entered the premises, unsure of what they might find. As they made their way toward the bathroom, their anticipation was reaching its peak. And then, they saw it. A motionless body lying on the floor, garbage bags found on the scene contained wet bath mats, towels, a blood-stained pillowcase, and wads of torn telephone cords. In the neighbor's account, Martha knew who the murderer was and fled the house shortly after Jeffrey died, but was unsure if the man was still in the house. However, this didn't match the firefighters' findings, as Jeffrey had seemed to have passed away for quite some time. Another neighbor, Karen, caught sight of a Hispanic man with shoulder-length hair running down the neighborhood at about 3.30 p.m. She got her husband to flag down a police car that was headed to the Freeman household to tip them off. The manhunt was on, and they eventually found Raphael hiding in the attic at a nearby house that was still under construction. This time, Tony decided to tell the police about Martha's extramarital affair with Raphael after witnessing the arrest. In contrast to Raphael, Martha was candid and forthcoming about her involvement during the interrogation. She confessed that she had met Raphael on the night of July 4th after Jeffrey had returned home. Along with two other men, she and Raphael committed adultery in the hotel room. After their initial breakup earlier that year, Martha reconciled with Raphael in March and allowed him to live in her two by eight foot closet. While Jeffrey was at work during the day, Raphael had free reign of the house. But at night, he would sneak back into his makeshift bed in the closet. Nevertheless, Jeffrey discovered him there on April 10th, 2005, and the arrangement came to an end. It was around 10 p.m. that night when Jeffrey heard someone snoring and tracked the noise to Martha's bedroom. Upon opening her closet, he discovered Raphael sleeping inside. Surprisingly, Jeffrey remained calm and told Martha he would be taking their dog for a walk, expecting Raphael to have left by the time he returned. On his return, Jeffrey was greeted with his own shotgun pointing at him by Raphael. While Jeffrey was forced into the bathroom defenseless, Martha sat in the adjacent room listening to the torture her husband was going through. The cause of death was thought to be strangulation, but it was also theoretically possible that he was drowned. The police didn't suspect Martha at first. Their assumption was that she too must have felt helpless in the face of Raphael's rage. When Raphael went on trial, Martha appeared as a witness and provided her testimony with what was already known. However, when she was questioned by Raphael's lawyer as to why she hadn't called for help within a time frame of 16 hours, she merely stated that she did not have an answer to that question. This reply was not missed by the judge, Casey Moreland. He stated, I have problems with allowing this to go any further without allowing her some representation because I can see her being charged in this case. She probably should be charged in this case. I hope the state does not believe everything she's testifying to, because I sure don't. As requested by the judge, further investigation was conducted to find out Martha's whereabouts within that 16-hour time frame. Around 11 p.m. on April 10th, she called Jeffrey's mother Hazel, as they usually do each week. She reported Martha as being as happy as a lark after learning that Jeffrey was ill and had fallen asleep early after his medication. After running some errands the following morning, Martha headed to Walgreens to pick up an antidepressant prescription. Clearly, Martha had enough time to escape Raphael and call for help, but she chose not to do so. Investigators found that someone attempted to clean up after the crime. On August 22, 2005, Martha was arrested and tried alongside her lover, Raphael. Because a divorce would have left Martha with a smaller financial share, the prosecution believed it was more convenient to simply get rid of Jeffrey. Raphael's defense argued that Martha committed the heinous act against her husband and then shifted the blame to Raphael since he was an illegal immigrant. Martha's defense, however, said it was a struggle for Martha's love between the two men. 
In any case, Martha Freeman and Rafael Rocha Perez were sentenced to life for the murder of Jeffrey Freeman on September 28, 2006. It will be 51 years before they will be eligible for parole. Remember to subscribe. Thanks.